Welcome to the 15th episode of When Life Hands You Lenins. This episode, I sit down with one of my good friends, Sean Carpenter. Now, I met Sean about four or five years ago when we had started college online. Um, we were in a sim- we were in the same class, and we were put in a group project together. And as anybody's best guess, nobody likes group projects because somebody always does all the work, and everybody else wants the credit. But when Sean and I worked together, he and I were the ones that did both of the, all of the work. He took one portion of the project. I did the other portion of the project. We compared. We had meetings, all this stuff, and we compared. And I knew that Sean was somebody that I wanted to be connected with. And so here we are. He's on my podcast now. So Sean was a graduate of the recording arts program from Full Sail, and I was a graduate of the music production program. We both have very similar um, passions for music and audio, but Sean's leans more towards the sound design for video games and a little bit of movies. So Sean tells us a little bit about, or actually a lot about, what sound design is, what it was like working on the Madden video games, a triple A title, how he got those opportunities. And he even tells us a little bit about what um, Foley is, and I even put him on the spot for how to design an explosion, and he kind of calls me out a little bit because he I wasn't specific enough as to what types of material exploding. Is it is it a grenade? Is it a flash grenade? Is it a, a nuclear explosion? What is it? Um, so he kind of explains how he would do that and how he's done it in the past. Sean got his start in music. Um, he had similar passions. He's kind of grew up in music, so he listened to a lot of like the heavy metal, and then he was in a heavy metal band as well. So that's kind of where everything started. Um, but once he got to college, he realized that he had other passions, and that was for sound design, and he wants to do that for the rest of his life. So he tells us a little bit about what it was and what it is and how it's important and factors into a movie and how it can take make or break a movie, in fact. Um, but I don't want to keep talking and rambling. I want Sean to tell his story, and he does a much better uh, way of describing what sound design is, what Foley is, how to make explosions, and all that fun stuff. But before we dive in, I want to remind you to please sign up for my mailing list as it helps me notify you when new episodes like this are live. Also, I would encourage you to support me on Patreon, because the money that I make on there goes directly back into the podcast, as well as has some cool perks that you may be interested in. Also, I would very much appreciate a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts and or a review, as it helps boost the ratings within Apple Podcasts so it can be discovered by other podcast listeners. And lastly, if you or someone you know would be a good guest for the show, there is a guest request form that I would encourage you to fill out, and then I will get into contact with you and we can potentially set something up for you to be a guest on the show. So with all of that mumbo jumbo out of the way, I want to introduce you to my good friend and multi-talented sound designer, musician, and one of the hardest working people in the business that I know. Mr. Sean Carpenter. I have a good friend of mine, Mr. Sean Carpenter. He is a good sound designer. He's an engineer, audio engineer. He went to school with me, different programs, but similar passions. So without me telling a little too much about you, why don't you tell everybody about yourself and where you grew up and where you got your passion and tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Uh, So... I grew up in a little town called St. Mary's, Ohio, population of like 8,000 people, surrounded by corn and cows, and you know the deal. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always had a passion for music, Uh, so I I grew up, I I loved my, the hard rock, heavy metal, rock and roll type thing. Um, I got a lot of that from my dad, 
I would grow up listening to ACDC and Iron Maiden and things. And then from mom, I had all like the Garth Brooks and Reba McIntyre. So I had a fairly diverse um, music path growing up. I have a respect for, you know, all different types of music, but heavy metal is kind of where I found my my real passion. Uh, I got into playing music. I uh, got a guitar, started playing that, and uh, then I found out, I could scream. And so I was I actually ended up with a couple different metal bands uh doing lead vocals and um aside from that I also had this parallel life that I was living where I also like I didn't go outside a whole lot. I loved video games and and computers and and I eventually got to the point to where I started learning how to build my own computers. And at the time, I just saw this was two different passions. I had a passion for audio, and I had a passion for, like, computer tech stuff. And once the last band that I was in, we got to a point where we were able to start going into studios. And we quickly realized, as a local band, how expensive that was. And I was like, well, I'm a computer nerd. Maybe I can just throw together some gear and actually do this myself. So I started tinkering around. I think back at the time I was using Cool Edit Pro as my audio software. And we were just recording like single track at a time. And then I'd bounce that out and then record another track and bounce it. And then we would throw it all all together and actually try to mix it. But that was kind of where I started. Like I was like... I can totally do this. And uh, that progressed into a a bigger passion. You know, I stopped playing music uh, because life happened. I met my wife and, you know, it was that I'm getting older and it's time to settle down type of thing. And so I was like, I still really want to be part of the music industry, but, you know, I I don't have time. I have bills (laughs) and stuff to try and play and tour and that sort of thing. So... I started building more and more gear, and we were fortunate enough that the place we were living, I could have a a separate bedroom that was just nothing but audio gear. And so I had opened a a small in-house studio where I was doing some local work, and I had a band by the name of Red Briar uh, come to me, and they were like, you know, we'd like you to record our EP, and, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do with that. So we ended up recording the EP, and their lead singer, Josh, was like, you know, hey, like, just some feedback. Everything sounds great, but we feel this probably could have been done quicker. And I was like, you know, okay, I appreciate the feedback, and I started thinking about it, and I was talking with my wife, and, and she goes, well, why don't you go back to school? And at the time, I was like, well, I'm 29 years old. Like, I've already been graduated. I was working in factories, and... You know, just doing the typical small town, what you do, you either work in a factory or on a farm or things like that. And and so the thought of going back to school had never really crossed my mind. And But she's always been my driving force. So she was like, no, you should, you should really look into it. And I had a cousin and a friend who had graduated from Full Sail. Um, my cousin did the the music production associates and a friend of mine did the film bachelors on campus and and they both had nothing but great things to say about full sale and so i was like well you know I'll, I'll check out the school and you know see what's what and i really liked everything that i was seeing and so i called and started talking to the admissions reps and they were like yeah you know like we think you'd be a great fit you know you've already like done like home studio work and you've recorded bands and you seem to have a good passion and so I was actually enrolled before we even decided to fly down and check out the school and that just sold it even further yeah um, I sound like I'm trying to market full sale right now but in all honesty like it was a really great decision and uh, so I, we came down from Ohio, we moved down here, and I started having classes. And uh, because of my experience so far, I, I got a little cocky. I, I had an ego, and I was like, 
this is cake. I already know how to do this. I'm going to walk through this degree program. And about six months in, I was like a deer in headlights where I was like, oh, shoot. I don't actually know as much as I thought I did. And, and it was very humbling very quickly. And so it was at that point where I was like, I need to get my stuff together. And I, I need to like buckle down and really focus because I have an opportunity here and I don't want to waste it. So I really started diving in deep with my classes. I started trying to get as much insight from my instructors as I could and learn as much as I could. I was the guy who would make class run over because I always had questions and things like that. And then I started having classes for interactive audio and creating sounds for video games and movies and applications and then all of a sudden, that computer nerd side of me, that parallel lifestyle started coming back. And I was like, wait a minute, I can merge these. And so I, I really fell in love with the whole aspect of sound design and creating audio assets that sound like one thing, but they were actually recorded using a completely different object. And, and for me... If I don't have that creative outlet, I start to go a little crazy. So I wasn't playing music anymore, and I really like the recording aspect of it, but doing sound design also allowed me to do the creative side. And so I started getting into sound design and like creating sound assets and Foley, and I was like, this could get me in a position where I could actually end up getting paid to play video games all day and at 30 years old being able to act like a 12 year old was was perfect um so i really got in depth with the the sound design for you know video games that was my core area uh foley for film was was neat um but it was it's very linear so for example on this on a screen, if you see a motorcycle drive by, you hear the sound of the motorcycle. And then if you rewatch the movie, you're going to hear that exact same sound just over and over and over again. You only have the one motorcycle sound. Whereas in a video game, it's very dependent on where the player is standing. Maybe the player is on the motorcycle this time instead of another player driving by. So you have to think about perspective and how close you are and... You know, maybe the motorcycle drove by slow this time, but next time it's going to drive by real fast. So now we're looking at even different frequency ranges for the RPMs of the motorcycle. And my brain lit up because now not only am I dealing with audio and video games, I'm also dealing with all the math and the science that go into actually creating those sounds. And immediately it was a career field switch. Like I, when I came to Full Sail... All I wanted to do is I wanted to work in recording studios with hard rock and heavy metal bands. And now all I want to do is work on video games. So that's that's kind of my my growing up story and and coming to full sale. Interesting. It's it's very um inspiring to see like all those kind of career changes because I think everybody goes through them at some point. We all Everybody that I've spoken to has gone, they've gone to school and they think, well, this isn't for me or they take a certain class and it kind of switches. And like for you, that was with interactive audio and being able to trigger those certain things is really unique. And like you said, in a movie, it's very linear in those video games. A lot of people aren't thinking of those things right. like, oh, what if the motorcycle had driven by in the storyline slower last time rather than it sped by, you know, there's all kinds of different things that factor into it and it's much more creative. So you mentioned in the uh, description that you had sent in to be on the podcast that you have designed sound for Madden 18 and 19. Tell us a little bit about that, um, how you got those opportunities, what they were like, um, what, how did that come about? Okay. Um, so when, when I worked on Madden in 18 and 19, um, unfortunately, I didn't get to do the actual sound design. Um, it was more so just an audio artist engineer. Um, for Madden 18, 
that was that actually came from one of my lab instructors when I was at Full Sail. Um, he got a hold of me and he goes, "Hey, I have this contract to do some dialogue editing, and it's more than I can take on. I'd like to subcontract you." So when my first taste with anything AAA game related uh, was subcontracted. So I'm, I'm not in the credits of Madden 18, but I got to do a lot of editing all the commentary. So like the announcers that you hear while the game's playing, I got just hours and hours of takes. And it was real basic, go in and make sure there's a short fade on the, the top and tail, make sure there's no clipping, make sure it's the right dialogue line, check the script. Uh, so that was my experience with Madden 18, and it kind of gave me a little taste. But that was all, like, I was sitting at home in my home studio doing that. And then a friend of mine, uh, John Hughes, got a job working at EA as an audio artist. And he, as well as one of my instructors, Tom Todia, who is now fully at EA, um, like they both knew that I was interested in trying to get back in because being in Orlando, they're the only big video game company in the area. So uh, while personally, you know, I'm not a big sports fan, just the thought of being able to work on AAA titles was, was really awesome. So I had kind of talked to them and had a little bit of inside help, um, sent in my resume and my portfolio, had the interview, which um, they started out my interview going, this is just going to be a general interview and there's not going to be a lot of tech questions. And then about three questions in, it was like, so how, tell us how you would make a seamless loop and how would you compress this and do that? And, <laughs> and it turned very technical very quick. Um, but because of the great training that I had, from college, you know, I was able to answer all those questions just right there on the spot, and and they felt that I was a good fit, so they brought me in, and they actually brought me in as a music editor for Madden 19, uh, specifically on their story mode, Long Shot, which they introduced with Madden 18, and so like they're they're like well, you're going to be on like the story mode, you're not going to be on the main gameplay. And I was like, okay, you know, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm getting that triple a credit. So it was done a lot, almost like a movie. It was done very linear because the way that Madden story mode is, there's a lot of cinematics. And then if you go to the, the football field, then you play and then it goes back to the cinematics and it tells the story of, you know, these two guys who are trying to make it in the NFL and so I got to see not only the video game side of it, but some of the linear post-audio film type side. So I was doing all of the, the music editing, whether it was just like a background music clip that you might hear, like um, that's not actually in the game, or maybe you're in the diner and you hear music coming from the jukebox. So I have to worry about, like, okay, where's the jukebox at? Like, how far away is it? How low do we need it? Because we're also doing, you need to be able to hear the dialogue and things like that. Um, so it was really cool to, to get that AAA experience. Um, but it was, just, it was contract work because in the video game world, the audio team is the last team to really get their hands on a game. You know, you have to wait on your models and your animations and, and all your coding to get done so that you know exactly what you're working with. I mean, like, concept art can show me a picture of yeah, an object, like, say, because right now I'm working on a game with a company f called Razor Edge Games where we're doing kind of a post-apocalyptic game. And so we have weapons. So you can give me a picture of this rifle that you created. But until animation gets their hands on it and I can see how it's loaded, how it's unloaded and fired. So like audio is always the last kind of department to come in on a video game. And so it's, it's a lot of contract work. Yeah. You know, like if you have a full-time job, 
as an audio artist at a game company, hang on to it because the rest of us are, are doing contracts. We're all freelance, just trying to get our foot in the door. Because, for example, with Madden, they put out a new Madden game every year. Well, the audio department really only functions for a few months. So they code the game, they make all the assets, they do all their, uh, they do a lot of mocap and green screen movements for their animations. And then that comes to the audio department. So while they're busy doing that, we don't really have a whole lot to work on. Um, so they, instead of just hiring people to work year round, they just bring in contract work. So um, that was the last big game that I've worked on. Like I said, I'm working on a game uh, called Eden Falling from Razor Edge Games that we're hoping to have out sometime this year. Okay. So this is something you definitely want to do f- forever. Absolutely. This is something you love. And it's and thinking about it because we both have creative audio backgrounds. We, I can just see how... I was thinking, oh, just give me a picture of it. But now that you say that, oh, I need an animation of how it's loaded, how it's fired, how big it is, what it's going to look like. Right. There's a lot of aspects that go into that. For example, let's say to a typical person, if I say I need the sound of a door closing. Okay. Most people think like their bedroom door. I need to know what that door is made out of. I I need to know if it's a wood door, if it's a metal door, is it a screen door? What type of hinges is it on? Maybe it's a futuristic door. Maybe it's on hydraulics and it slides. Is it outside or inside? Right. I need to know what the room looks like because I'm also going to have to set up the reverb zone. And I need to know the math and the science of how the audio is going to bounce around that room based on the player's perspective. So there's a lot of different aspects that I need to know when creating those audio assets. Wow. Yeah, there's (laughs) there's really a lot that uh, people don't get into that stuff when you're playing a video game you just think oh it's a door closing let me just record something that the door's closing but like if i were to record my door closing a a wood one and then you go to it's actually a steel door it's not gonna right portray right it's gonna pull you out of that immersive uh, area right or like you said if if it's a hydraulic door that is gonna sound a lot different Mm -hmm. so once these sounds are recorded What's it like implementing them? Did you get to see a lot of that side or is that a completely separate team? Were you recording like the dialogue or did you just get it and you were editing it? Uh, I just got the dialogue, um, but it's done in, in typical fashion. You know, you have your, your voice actors come into the studio. They, they step into the vocal booth. They have their scripts in front of them and then they read line by line. Uh, there's an audio director there. It was like, okay, you know, maybe you want to give this part of the line a little bit more inflection or, you know, could you say this part a little quicker? Um, so it's it's almost like recording, like, vocals for music, except now you don't have a beat to go off of. So as far as voiceovers, um, like, I, I know, how, like, I was able to see the process. I just wasn't involved with it. Uh, I just got the audio tracks and had to cut them. As far as implementation, um, EA actually has their own proprietary um, game engine. So it was that was a little bit of a learning curve because I was actually I was working on a timeline. So I would see the the animated scene start playing, and I needed to place like keyframe markers, essentially, with a tag on it, the, a music tag. So as the the timeline plays it hits that keyframe marker with the tag that says go out and grab this music file and start that music file here and then another keyframe marker that says okay go ahead and end it here and then i would have to do multiple timelines if i had any music tracks that overlapped but all of as far as like ducking around vocals that was actually all done in pro tools Instead of, um, with a lot of game engines, you can set up so that, like, say there's an explosion or there is music in the background and then somebody starts talking, you can write the code so that, um, just like the ducking process in your DAW, like, if your your kick drum is hitting, you might want your bass guitar to dip automatically. So you'll set up those side chains uh, with uh, the Frostbite engine, like I was actually cutting out everything in Pro Tools 
So I would have, I would pull in the, the cinematic videos. I would put those into my Pro Tools session. And then I would have to go in and manually carve out everywhere that there was dialogue. Um, so it was tedious, but it was also a lot of fun. Like I, as you said, like, I want to do this forever. I can sit there and do it for 10, 12, 16 hours a day. It doesn't matter. I'll be doing this when I'm 70, 80, hopefully. Mm -hmm. So how long would something like that take you? Like the project, how long did it take you to do all that manual editing? Uh, at the time, like, I was since this was my first real experience with it, I had to try and develop that workflow. Mm -hmm. So I, in all honesty, it probably took a little longer than it should have. But once I got into the workflow, it was it was real simple. Like because I also I had the dialogue track available, you know, and and we've been doing this long enough, you know, we can look at a wave file and go, there's audio there. So it's stuff that I could automatically just like, okay, here's a chunk of audio in the dialogue section. Let's just go ahead and, and take our pencil tool and pro tools and we'll just carve it out. Um, and I could do that real quick without even looking or listening to the, the voiceover tracks. I could just go ahead and look at it and cut. And then I would go back and give it a QA pass and go, okay, yeah, this, this cut could be a little deeper or maybe it needed to be a little more shallow. Um, so I can make those adjustments. And so once I got into it, uh, we did start to finish. Uh, I was with EA for f three and a half, four months. And start to finish, it was done. Oh, wow. So it wasn't too bad. And how much did you work per week? Uh, I was 40, 40 45 hours. hours, yeah. I think it was a regular full-time job. I was at EA Sports uh, headquarters, which was really cool. That place is so beautiful. Yeah. Where is it at? Uh, it's over in Maitland. Okay. So it's not too far from here. No. no yeah. I think it was like a 25-minute drive to work. Oh, wow. That's, that's not bad at all. So let's dive into a little bit of the what sound design is, because I know you had made a Facebook status many, many years ago prior to like when we had first <laughs> met. I'll, I'll always remember this is, and you, I think you told me this when we had first met when we got to campus and we were standing in line for an event or something, or maybe it was to get, I don't remember what it was for orientation, but you had made a comment on somebody had told you to get a real job. Oh yeah. And you had basically said, okay, the next time you go to the grocery store, put in headphones and I don't remember if it was a Facebook status or you had actually told me, but I've shared that a couple times because people don't realize how important sound design is yeah, and yeah. music, just audio in general. I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I remember that post. I remember the event happening. Um, I was actually standing in line um, <laughs> in an Arby's and uh, the, there was a lady in front of me and I, I had a shirt on uh, that said uh, sound engineer. And on the back of it, it says, only because a badass mother expletive uh, isn't an actual job title. And she looked at me and she goes, is a sound engineer a job title? And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And, um, and she goes, well, why don't you get a real job, like a teacher or a factory worker or a police officer? And, and those are real jobs, and those are necessary jobs, and I commend people who do those jobs. But I, I was taken back by it, and I was like, well, do me a favor. I said, the next time you get in your car, turn your radio off. Or the next time you're watching TV, hit the mute button, and then you tell me if you still enjoy those things. And if you don't, think a sound engineer because without those and we go through our daily lives without really thinking about it um you know it's it doesn't affect us directly so we just turn on the radio for enjoyment we don't think about the recording process that the artist and the engineers went through the long hours that they sent spent in the studio like night in night out getting all that recorded, the mixing, the mastering that all went into that just for you to click a dial and go, oh, hey, that's a cool song. So 
it's we're we're the behind the scenes people. We don't always get the recognition that we should, um, or at least that I feel we should. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's so. I mean, I I understand why people don't think that that's an actual job. Just like when I tell people like I play video games all day, and they're like, oh that's a job (laughs) you're darn right it's a job it's a multi-billion dollar industry (laughs) job and uh i mean sure i get to play video games all day but like the video game industry like you just said it's a multi-billion dollar industry it's it's blowing up a lot of people um think video games are like oh you know my my kid plays this game on his phone or or whatnot but then we start looking at like the esports, which is blowing up right now. And you've got like your your Call of Duty teams and your CS:GO teams, your Fortnite teams, and things like that. And these are these are people who, I mean, some of them are in their teens, and then some of them are in their thirties. It's men, women, doesn't matter. The target demographic for video games has widened so much over the last several years. And it's absolutely amazing to see, like, a lot of people, they're like, oh, I'm not a gamer. Do you play games on your phone? Well, yeah, I got, like, Candy Crush and stuff. Like, then you play games. Like, it's the entertainment value. Just like whether you're watching TV or the movies or you listen to the radio in your car. Like there's so much that goes into that and, and the market for these people, it's huge and I love it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I play video games, but I'm not as into them as somebody like you or other people are, but mm-hmm. I, I understand how big this industry is and how massive and how important it is because now look, we, video games are being implemented into education. Absolutely. We have colleges and we have middle schools and elementary schools. In fact, the one that I grow, the, uh, the school back home has iPads. And some of their assignments are to play interactive video games. Mm-hmm. There's a market there for that. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of that started, like, I, even back when I was in school, which, like, high school, elementary school, even, that felt like so long ago. Um we had the games like the old fashioned Oregon trail. And so on the surface, it was like, Oh yeah, here's this fun little game that we can play on the computer to pass time. And then you look at things like, Oh, this is teaching me that I need to actually plan. And like, if I don't have enough food supply for my trip, I'm going to die. Or I, if I don't have enough, wood supplies and I break a wagon wheel like it's it's the behind the scenes things that it's teaching you and I mean it's unfortunate that a lot of um you find a lot of kids that like the attention span is is very short and and we only have ourselves to blame because of technology so now we have to develop the technology to combat that but you know even growing up like we had like the math games and the typing games that added that that fun win element and we're i feel like as humans we're all competitive by nature so now if i'm taking a typing test and i can get a higher score than you now i'm better and in the actuality of it, it's like yeah you're learning how to type on a computer <laughs> so yeah. or i did more math problems quicker than you and and then you get games like math blasters where you have like math problems floating in the sky and you have a spaceship that you have to try and like blast the right number to solve the math problems and so it adds that game element and now we have things like uh roomy which is a completely vr educational space uh, which was actually developed by two of our our full sale hall of fame graduates um and so now we're in a world where you can put on a VR headset, be taken into a virtual world just like a video game, and you can have all these different objects. And 
it's a complete learning environment, but because you're so immersed in this game world that you don't really notice. Um, like you'll have games where you need to buy stuff. So now you're looking at, okay, well, I need to save money so that I can buy this object in the game. But a lot of that transfers to real life. So, okay, I want this car. So now I need to learn how to save my money and only buy the things that I need. <laughs> so there's a lot of real life applications in video games that we only think about like on a subconscious level. Mm -hmm. And, but because those things are so important and because the immersion level is so important in those games, that's where somebody like me who is a sound designer, I need to, I need to be cognizant of that. I need to focus on what are the sounds that I'm going to create for your game learning experience that isn't going to pull you out of that immersion level. I need to make sure that you stay there. I need to make sure that you audibly feel like you're in these environments because as soon as that immersion level gets broken, the concentration's broken, the learning stops. So it's up to me to be subtle and, and make you feel like you're there without trying to be over the top and disrupting the learning process. So it's, there's a real fine line that you have to tiptoe uh, in the learning process with audio to make sure that you're not breaking that concentration. And I, I know like that deviated from our original topic, but no, but that was, that was great information because even coming back is a lot of parents and people think, oh, video games are a bad thing. But as you had just went in depth with, there are a lot of subconscious things that it's teaching us is if we don't have enough wood to build this, what's, we're not going to fix our broken wagon wheel. But a lot of parents think of it as, oh, it's taking time away from my son or daughter. They should be playing outside. That's how they learn real life things. Right. And and that's kind of the environment that I grew up in when I was a kid, too. I mean, luckily, like my dad played video games. Like we would sit up and play Twisted Metal for hours on the PlayStation. I love that game. <laughs> Um, living in Florida, I wish Twisted Metal was a real thing on I-4. Anyway. Yeah, it should be. <laughs> um, so, like, when I got into video games, like, there was an understanding. But there was still those moments where it's like, you should probably go outside and, and just do something instead of being a lazy blob on the couch. Interact and, with people. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't want a people today. Yeah, I don't want a people today. <laughs> um. So, I mean, I understand that aspect. And, and you do want your kids to be active and, and doing things. But uh, nowadays, you see a lot of, like, even six- and seven-year-old kids who have iPads. And so I feel like we are kind of getting away from that stereotypical, like, if you sit too close to the TV, you're going to go blind type of thing. And, like, you need to stop playing video games and do something with your life. And and I took that and I ran with it. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do something with my life. I'm going to play video games. So it's it's really awesome to see, like, the way technology has expanded and is allowing us to give that learning. Um, because, like, there are even applications and games out there that are teaching your six- and seven-year-old how to speak another language. I mean, you know, there's really great things like Duolingo for, you know, somebody who's like, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do this course. But then, you know, your seven-year-old doesn't want to read through just some really plain, dry text. Their brains are always working, and, and we needed to adapt to that. So then we have applications now. And, like, even as far as, like, Dora the Explorer as a cartoon – you know, we have kids now who they're watching the cartoons, but they're also subconsciously getting those those Spanish words. And so now, like, we have kids that are, you know, six, seven years old who know way more Spanish without ever taking a Spanish class than I do. And I took Spanish in high school. <laughs> and and it's all because of that that entertainment and that interactive value. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. There's, I would rather learn a language by playing a video game than sitting and reading English sentences and then this is how to say it in Spanish. Right. 
I would much rather play a video game for it. So coming into let's let's get into the these video games and dive into coming back to oh sound design is not or sound engineer isn't really a career path when it absolutely is. When you look at all the things that we've just discussed, th- there is a whole team behind that entire application or video game or TV show or a uh, new application to teach you a new language. So I know prior to us starting, we talked a little bit about Foley and like it's not really your thing. What is Foley? Can you go into a little bit of it? Because I know you have more experience in it than I am, than I have. And explain what sound design in and kind of what it entails. I know it's kind okay. of a broad thing, right. but you are the guy <laughs> to ask for this. Okay. So so Foley actually got started. Um, Foley stemmed from the guy's last name who, who invented it um, or came up with a concept. Um, I'm not even going to try and pretend like I remember his first name. I just know his last name is Foley. Um, and it wasn't Mick Foley the wrestler. So back in the day when before TV, all we had was radio. And so, yeah, you could listen to radio and, and hear music, but you would also get into like stories. Um, for example, the original war of the worlds. So you had all of these different aspects, um, of stories, but you didn't want to just sit there and listen to somebody tell a story that's really dry and boring, and nobody wants to listen to that. So they would do sound effects in the background, like whether it was a horse galloping where they would use wood blocks, or they would use uh, orchestral instruments. Like when uh, somebody fell down, you would hear the on a trombone. Um, so a lot of that got started which then made it segue into silent films. And so in even though it was a quote-unquote silent film, you still heard music. And then the orchestra would do a lot of uh, just like the trombone noises, but now you're seeing it to picture. And those those sounds, whether you know you were spinning a crank or tapping the wood blocks, that once we started putting that to picture, it became a staple. And a lot of it was was very cheesy. Like I said, some of it was orchestral. But then once we started developing movies further, we started using actual sounds. And sometimes, one, once we got into the, where movies were actually capable of having like their own sound where like an old, even though it was a black and white movie, you know, you see a car drive by, you hear the car drive by. Um, So we started having actual production audio. And then we found out that you could, you could start to fabricate some of these sounds. And so now you have things like if you see somebody bite into a sandwich that has some lettuce on it, you have somebody off screen who's taking like a paper bag and they're slowly crumpling that paper bag up to give that lettuce crunch type of sound. And, and that's really where it stemmed from. Uh, so Foley is, is the fabrication of sounds and sound effects to sync up with the story. You know, it's not necessarily a movie, it's just a story in some way. And so now we have in present day with sound design, we have all the digital capabilities. You know, we can go through with synthesizers and we can create like the lasers or whatever, you know, if you're working on a space movie. Um, But we still do a lot of the old fashioned Foley work. For example, in the movie Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2, Um, it's an entirely animated movie, so you don't have a movie set that you have you're pulling production audio from and in that movie there's a scene where there are hamburgers raining out of the sky and landing on a wooden boat dock and the the foley artists what they're actually doing is they're they have a bucket of water and a pile of shop rags and they're 
they have the wa- the rags dipped in water and they're recording themselves throwing these wet sopping wet rags at a wood pallet. And so as you see the the hamburger hit the wooden boat dock, you hear this sound as the the wet rag is is hitting or there's a bird in a metal trash can in that movie that like he starts flying away so you hear the feathers on the side it's actually a feather duster that they're smacking on the side but they're actually using a real metal trash can so we can use some elements that are are true to what you're seeing on the screen and then there are some completely you wouldn't even think that that's what it was Uh, for example we live in florida we don't get snow so we'll use cornstarch cornstarch and a heavy work boot it actually crunches just like snow and you and i both originating from the north you know we know what snow sounds like when you step on it absolutely we do and and i've done some some foley work with cornstarch and i gotta tell you even being from the north it sounds spot on so there's a lot of really cool things that we can do to fabricate um if i had to recommend any one sound designer to look into there are so many documentaries on ben burt the guy who did star wars star wars even when it came out in the 70s was so far ahead of its time not only visually but from an audio standpoint like everything from how the lightsabers were created to the blasters and and granted there's a lot of flack for when you get into things like oh this is in space and there's no sound in space yeah, this is also a movie. Um, so there's a lot of really creative decisions. And there's an interview with Ben Burt where he actually talks about that. And uh, most notably in, I believe it was Star Wars Episode Two, um, The Clone Wars. Uh, where, er, yeah, the second one. Um where they're flying through space and there's a bomb that goes off inside an asteroid and the design of this bomb is that it's actually a gravity bomb. So when it goes off, it sucks everything in. So when they were looking at the the sound design for this bomb, if it's a gravity bomb that's sucking everything in, it's also going to suck in sound. So when it goes off and you see everything pull in, the movie actually goes silent for just a second because it's even all the audio, it sounds like it gets sucked into this bomb. And um, so Ben Burt is just an absolutely phenomenal sound designer and probably one of my biggest role models in the sound design world. Cool. So that was a good background on sound design and like what it entails. So a lot of people think, oh, it's a door closing or it's snow crunching, so why don't you just record those things and put them in? But that's not the fun part of it. (laughs) That kind of takes the fun out of sound design because I took a few classes in college where we had to do sound design and we weren't allowed to record the actual sound source of what it was coming from. Right. Um, There's... There are two different things. One we call real and then one we call hyper-real. And, and hyper-real is that, that far-fetched, over-the-top. Uh, so earlier we were talking about um, like gun sounds. Mm-hmm. So, for example, let's say I have, uh, I'm working on a movie or a game, and you have uh, a 44 Magnum being shot on screen. It's a revolver handgun. So when that sound goes off, sure, we could go out and we, re- we can record a revolver. That's fine. But um, obviously there's, there's a little bit that gets lost between the sound source and, and the actual capturing device. And, and we do the best that we can to try and, and minimize that. But then there's a lot of post-processing uh, that happens. For example, if you're, lo- you're doing gunshots your your sample rate has to be so large because there's so much dynamic range. You're going from silent to very, very loud very quickly. Um, so a lot of that does tend to get lost in the recording process, unfortunately. So what we'll do is we'll actually go through and we'll take 
maybe that sound. We'll do a couple gunshot sounds, and now we'll layer them together. Or we might actually have, um, for like the ring out of the gunshot, we might use the tail end of thunder. And so then we start layering in all of these um, different effects so that when that gunshot happens in the movie, it's a very meaty, like kind of punches you in the chest type of sound. Because if we were to actually just go out and record that revolver like we were talking about and then just place that over, you're going to be like, oh, that was that was weak. Like that was, especially in an action movie where you want to be on the edge of your seat. You want to be fully involved. And so when you hear that gunshot happen or you hear that car crash happen, you know, you don't want to hear just a little thunk as the cars hit. You want to hear the crunching of the metal. You want to hear the air coming out of the tire as it pops and you want to hear the rubber rip. And so there's all these different, different elements that we go into and create that hyper real sound design for it. And you make a good point of like layering too, because um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but my, one of my instructors had told us it was kind of a pop quiz in interactive audio. What was the Jurassic, the dinosaurs yes. in Jurassic Park. Yes. What were those roars? Because how are we supposed to record dinosaurs? We don't have dinosaurs. Nobody has ever heard a dinosaur. So how are we supposed to know what they sound like? Absolutely. So in the movie, you might be able to know exactly what it was, but it was what, a pig and a cow layered and pitched? Oh, or what I, was it that they I had? don't remember the exact. I, I'm pretty sure part of it was an elephant. Okay. Um, I know when, when you hear like the T-Rex kind of making that, that snarling noise, uh, they used alligators. Okay. Yep. That's which, right. which makes sense. I mean, given the reptile and, and like, mm -hmm. that's the closest you're probably going to get to mm -hmm. an actual dinosaur noise. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different sound elements that make, making beast noises like that is a lot of fun for me. Yeah. Um, it's cause you get to, you get to learn about animals. Like there are so many different things that you need to know. Like I need to know if I'm working on an outside game, if there's an owl, what region is that owl from? What type of owl? Is it a barn owl? Is it a screeching owl? Like, <laughs> is it a snow owl? Because they all make different sounds. Mm -hmm. And so one of the cool things about being a sound designer is then you get to learn a lot of really use, useless yet useful trivia. Like if somebody says, oh, in my movie, the, the guy driving in this car, um, it's going to be – he's going to drive by in a 1993 Geo Metro. I know – that the 1993 Geo Metro had a three-cylinder, one-liter engine in it um, so that you're not going to go through and, like, that engine is not going to sound meaty at all. It's going to sound like this little pop, 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 pop as it drives by. And most people, like, they don't know that the 1993 Geo Metro has a three-cylinder, one-liter engine in it. But I do because I have to look at things like that. And... So then you learn about, like like we were talking with the owls and the different animals, and there's so much useless, useful knowledge that goes into that with the layering. You think of like a movie as action-packed as, say, like Transformers, and how layered and how much sound design goes into something like that. So much. Because, I would not want to see that Pro Tool session. <laughs> oh, I can imagine what it looks like. Just the robots, and like because it's none of it's real, so you have to think way outside the box and think, well, you have this massive semi-truck that transforms into this robot. What is it going to sound like? How is it going to talk? What's, you know, what's it going to sound like when it's walking? How big is it going to be? All that right. stuff has to be factored in and it comes into like the creative aspect of it. Like, what am I going to use to record that? Right. And one thing that I've always found interesting, let's go into a little bit of a scenario. Let's see, how would Sean design this? <laughs> All right. So, you put me on the spot. Put here. me on the spot here. So, I've always, when I go to a movie, I like to hear them loud, especially like if it's an action movie. Sure. I like to hear like the grumbling of the low end. Mm -hmm. I think that really, like, for example, how would you record 
like a bomb going off, what would what would you kind of use for that to get the low end grumble to get the high end kind of everything? Um, so much of that is fake. <laughs> um, sounds that are super loud like that, you can actually get away with a lot of white noise. Okay. Um, so the the explosion happening. Um, you want to start looking at different types of impacts and even with an explosion, you, you gave me a very general, I want a bomb going off. Okay. Is it a, is it a frag grenade? Is it a flash grenade? Is it a missile? Is it, you know, how far away is it? So these are all things that I have to start looking at. Um, but just for, for the sake of scenario, pick uh, a bomb, (laughs) pick one, you name it. Um, let's say, you know, you, you've got like a hand grenade going off. Perfect. Um, so we want to start looking at different, um, impact sounds. So I'll start going through and uh, like for some of the, the grenade sounds that I've done in the past, uh, it's actually a metal stick hitting the side of an empty dumpster. So you get that, that metal meaty, very transient, um, initial impact sound, you get some of the reverb and then we'll start bringing in some of the white noise to, to beef that up a little bit. We'll EQ it to make sure that we've got our low end. Um, there's a couple different plugins that I use. Uh, there's one called thump that takes every frequency that you're working on and gives you a very clean, like, I think it's like two or three octaves down, just rumble. Uh, so we'll layer in, fabricated EQs. Um, we'll do the fade so it tails off. Uh, if we're doing something for a movie, you know, we might look, all right, did they throw this grenade into a building? Is the camera in the building? Then we'll do the reverb zones. So, um, so that, yeah, the, the impact sounds, I use a lot of metal on metal for explosions. Um, I love dumpsters, empty dumpsters. That's kind of my my go to when I create explosion sounds. Um, and I'll do I'll actually set up the microphone outside so that I capture the impact, and I'll also put the microphone inside the the dumpster so that um, just like you know how you move your mouth. If you move your mouth so it's a large open space, you get a lot of that deeper. Sound. So once we're inside the dumpster with the microphone, you get automatically a lot of that natural low end. And uh, the, the less you have to fabricate, the better. Um, so we'll not only you know just record one sound, we'll also record multiple perspectives of that sound, and we can layer those together. Um, Just like I've done footstep sounds where I've done the microphone on top of um, a wood board, but then we've actually stuck a microphone underneath, and we get a lot of that low end, and it sounds like a wood floor. Um, And that's the same thing that we would do for an explosion. Once you get into, like you have all your stuff um, recorded, it's very much about mixing. You don't want too much white noise or it's going to sound like static or it's going to sound like water running and not enough. And your explosion sounds very weak. You know, we go back to that hyper realistic type sound. So it's, you mix in those layers. We might throw in some more thunder that we were using. Even with the gunshots, we might actually use gunshots. Um, or, I've done everything from something as simple as taking a stack of books and just dropping them on the floor to get that almost clap sound. So those are the things. If I was creating an explosion sound, that's that's what I would do. I would I would go to my go to dumpster and and start with some impact sounds. I would mix in some white noise, maybe some thunder, uh, maybe a couple gunshots, just depending on the the size of the explosion. So do you have a favorite thing that you like to create sound for? I love horror. I absolutely love horror genre. Um, 
I don't know if it's because I love doing it that it's easy or if I it, I love it because it's easy. Um, or if it's easy because I love it or if I love it because it's easy. And like growing up, again, you know, my dad was real big into horror movies. And so I remember at like seven, eight years old watching The Exorcist and Dawn of the Dead and and I really enjoyed those, even though like I would have nightmares. <laughs> but but as a genre, like especially with sound design, horror is one of those things that it's very, very immersive. Like you can watch an action movie and like, yeah, I was on the edge of my seat and that was cool. Horror is based so much around the interaction from the audience. You know, you want to make the audience scared. You know, you want to put them in that dark room or, you know, running from a killer or whatever the case may be. Um, so there's, there's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot of science that actually goes behind in, as far as like even human psychology. So one of the cool things that I feel as a sound designer is I feel like I have a superpower. I have the power to change your emotional state by manipulating airwaves. And so if you're getting ready to walk into a dark room, you know, you need to look at not only sound, but the music. The music plays a lot into it. Um, You see a lot of violin use. Because violin is a very raspy, creepy sounding. It can easily be one of the most beautiful instruments you listen to. can also be one of the scariest instruments you ever listen to. And so I love thinking about like how the, the mind works and how the mind perceives things. And the horror genre really lets me get into that. And... So, like I was saying, if you, if you're getting ready to the like the movie or the video game is getting ready to go into an area where you're not sure, it's dark. You you might have a low drone sound. Um, you might hear that violin type sound, and and then the dynamic range to all of a sudden like this creature jumps out. There's that instant transient. Um, and so while you might jump at the visuals, once you hear the, like the jump scare sound, like now all I did was in a half a second, I made a huge gi- dynamic jump, and now you have goosebumps, like because you jumped out of your seat. So that's why I really enjoy the, the horror genre is... I mean, maybe it sounds kind of sadistic. <laughs> I like toying with people's emotions, um, and I get to get paid to do it. Mm-hmm. I did a couple um, horror, little, like little feature film or little smaller films for a friend of mine, and I liked writing the music for it. Just the horror, the scary, the drone, really kind of digging into my darker side. Yeah. And eeriness, I love it. And I don't think... With horror movies, it doesn't have to be that complex. It's really not that complex, music-wise. And I don't think, even from a sound design point, like a drone can be something as simple as a, a filtered vacuum. Sure. Really? Yeah, it's, it does really get you thinking outside the box, though. Like, one of my favorite, absolute favorite things to do in the horror genre is, um, is what I call ghost reverb or reverse reverb. So you have a dialogue line and in the real world, you would never hear that dialogue line until somebody starts talking. But with ghost reverb, you actually hear um, the, the reverb tail. Cause what we'll do is we'll take a dialogue line and we'll reverse it inside our doll. And then we'll throw a reverb effect on it, and then we'll reverse it again. So instead of your reverb effect smearing it 
from beginning to end, it actually smears it from end to beginning. So as you listen to that dialogue track, you actually start to hear faint um, audible dialogue, and then all of a sudden the actual transient of the words start happening. And it's almost like if we've phased dimensions, like we're getting into the fourth dimension where time isn't actually real. And and so now that's almost like what it would sound like if you could hear things before they actually happened. And that's why Ghost Reverb is my absolute most favorite sound to do. Yeah, it's it's a really cool effect. And it's kind of hard. I'm trying to think of like a movie or a song that has an example of it. So if you're not real sure of because like I understand what it is, but somebody is hard like reverb and pitching it and reversing it and doing all this stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example that would have that. Well, any horror film, really. Um, the Yeah, actually, the last movie that I saw that had this effect done um, was uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Okay. <laughs> um, when they die, like when Bill and Ted are killed by the evil Bill and Ted, um, they actually have the ghost reverb effect on their vocals to to show that they're dead and like in that spiritual realm where you would kind of hear that that phase shift in reality mhm so when you're designing some of these sounds whether it be for video games or for a movie do you ever run into creative bumps where you're like i don't even know where to start with this oh sense. sure yeah all the time um, yeah, especially with a lot of, uh, futuristic sounds, like I can't even begin to, to start figuring out, like, say you have this spaceship, like, how is that spaceship working? Like, especially if like, you're like, oh, it's this futuristic technology. It works based on like hovering mechanics. I don't know. Like, so then I need to start looking more in depth and okay. What are the mechanics of the hovering aspect? Like, is it gears that are were like whirling and, and making that sound? Like, is it actually like a thruster? And, and so like initial concept. Yeah. There's a lot of roadblocks that you need to sit down and really problem solve and try to figure out exactly how those sounds are going to be created. So, and when you, when you have, um, these creative roadblocks and do you have like a whole sound bank that you've kind of recorded over the years and save on a hard drive and that you kind of revert to? I do. Um, we've got an external hard drive that is just full of sounds. I've got a couple, uh, sound libraries that I've purchased, you know, and, um, for example, uh, and Full Sail Hall of Fame graduate Rick Veers uh, has a ton of sound libraries that he puts out there, and and these the way these sound libraries work, you know, when you buy the sound library, you get the license to use it, and uh, so sometimes I'll go and I'll look at at different sound libraries. Um, if I know that I've seen a movie that has a spaceship in it, like I I might go watch that movie and try to draw inspiration and, and not necessarily try to recreate that sound, but like, okay, you know, what can I do that sounds similar, but different? So I'll look at libraries. I'll look at other things that have already been created, you know, like even in music, you know, you might draw your inspiration from other bands or artists. Um, so I do the same thing with other video games and movies when I do my sound design. Mm -hmm. And is there, do you have like a favorite sample pack that you've purchased or, and with these sample packs, I'm assuming they're, they're similar to, I'm um, like when you're pieing like musical sample packs, like you get kick drums and you get hi hats and you get snare drums or you get bass samples or whatever it may be. It's probably, it's a similar aspect as to sound design, right? Sure. Like yeah. you get like low thumps or things like that. Yeah, I mean, like I said, um, Rick Veers has a lot of really great um, sound libraries from Blastwave Audio. He's probably one of the largest, if not the largest sound library, like 
single person asset creation. He has a whole studio in his house that I was fortunate enough to see. And uh, I got to hang out with Rick at his place, and he showed me all of his gear and, and his Foley studios and whatnot, which was really cool. Um, but his sound effects have been used in everywhere from um, the final episode of Sons of Anarchy, where the... <laughs> I feel like it's been long enough. I don't have to say spoiler alert. Uh, the motorcycle gang's clubhouse blows up. And and those were Rick sounds. But one of the cool things about how Rick does it is he doesn't license his sounds to projects. He builds his libraries and he sells them. And then whoever wants to pick up his sound libraries can do it. So he actually ends up with sound assets in various different projects that he doesn't even know about. He's, I was talking to him one day, and he said that he was playing Halo with his son. And his, his son came back into the room and was like, Dad, why do you keep crashing the warthog into that rock? And he goes, because that's my sound. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, he's he's a good friend of mine. Yeah, he's a fellow Full Sail alum. And... His, his sound packs are just all around absolutely amazing. I do recommend checking out Blastwave Audio and, and checking out Rick Veer's sound packs. He does this really cool thing every summer where he has interns come in and he he takes on five or six interns and teaches them how to create Foley and sound packs. And then they always do like a little teaser movie to promote it. So it's also awesome to support, you know, supporting those packs also helps him be able to continue education for further sound designers and give them the opportunity. Like one of the sound designers he worked with as an intern is now out at Skywalker ranch and, and works with them on some of their audio. So it's, it's a 50, 50. My favorite sound pack is his stuff. I don't have a favorite of his, um, but he's kind of my go-to like, I love all the stuff that he creates and I also support like what he's doing with the money that he gets from creating it. Let's kind of go into a little bit about somebody who is interested in learning sound design and kind of picking it up or even thinking about pursuing it as a career. What are some things that they should be doing to kind of better themselves as a sound designer? Um, I mean, I, I fully stand behind Full Sail University. There are uh, several great colleges out there. Full Sail is the only one I have experience with, and, the, and they do teach a lot. Um, watch documentaries. I, I cannot tell you enough how, mon- how many documentaries on different sound design that I've watched. Um, if, if you have that passion for movies, you have that passion for video games and, and you really want to kind of develop that superpower that we were talking about, like I would recommend starting out with documentaries, uh, watching how sounds are created. Um, and then go to school, you know, it's whether it's full sale or not, like that's, that's neither here nor there. But definitely get an education in looking at all different types of audio. You know, whether it's um, you hear a lot of sound effects in music. So I would start there, like just really listening to everything. Open up your ears. Um, close your eyes, open up your ears, and just listen. And if you hear things that interest you, then maybe you have a, a passion for, for sound design. If you're ever if you've ever been curious of how it's made, then you might have a passion for sound design. And it's I'm assuming the it's a passion and it's a it's a career path that anybody can do as long as you have that passion. And it's similar to, say, a photographer or a musician or a filmmaker. If you are interested in photography, take pictures. Sure. If you're interested in film, make movies. If you're interested in writing music, 
write music. Pick up an instrument, learn piano, guitar, singing, whatever it is, just do it. If you're interested in sound, start clapping things together, start banging things together. And you don't even have to have high-end audio gear. Use your phone, use the resources you have, and start learning from them before you start diving into some of the expensive aspects of it. Sure, absolutely. Um, it's... It's a craft that it's it's easy to get into and hard to master. It varies. <laughs> um, so just like you said, you know, you can you can take anything. Like you can take your phone and start recording. Like now we have, you know, a crunch sound already recorded right here on this podcast. And so like it's just simple things like that you can start getting into and and just learning as you go. Like. Oh, okay. So I used, say, this plastic water bottle to make a crunch sound for somebody eating a sandwich, like we were talking about earlier. What other crunch sounds? So then you start really exploring different obst- obstacles and different paths, and you're kind of learning on your own. The learning things like that to know what to use for certain objects, I don't feel like a school can teach you. How to mix them together and layer and EQ, sure, all day long. But there's an art form. And when it comes to knowing, like we were talking about with the explosions, like knowing that I can go use a dumpster and then some thunder, like those are things that you learn by doing. That's not something, I mean, sure, I can sit here and tell you, like, oh, yeah, you could try this or you could try that. But maybe there's a better sound out there than hitting the side of a dumpster and using thunder. And I haven't found it yet. Um, so that part is a very trial and error. You just, you got to get your hands dirty and just do it. Mm-hmm. And what I'm thinking is find a friend that also does music or even find there's websites that provide like free little two minute videos that you can download and just start putting sounds together. Record a couple sounds and then put them in together with iMovie. Yeah, and just absolutely. and get rid of the original sound and put in your own sounds and just see how they work and how they're interacting with each other and with the movie does it make sense what you cuz once you put them together you'll see what works oh, oh it could have been thumpier oh it could it was too heavy or it was too much of this or it doesn't need this or maybe hitting the two drumsticks together or hitting the table was too much i didn't need that layer Right, you got to put together two and two together. Absolutely, and I've actually found. um, I mean, they they say don't use like friends or family to critique your work. Um, The best people I found to critique my work are people who know nothing about audio. If I provide you with some sounds, and if if it takes you as just a general user. Out of the immersion level, I know I've done something wrong. Um, because an audio person is going to be listening. They're going to be critical. They're not going to let themselves get into that immersion. To be completely honest, my my education in audio has ruined movies for me. Um, I don't even listen to the radio that much in the car because I'll hear something and go, oh, I'd have mixed that different. Or, you know, I might have, like, turned that snare down a little bit. Or I watch movies and, for example, the the remake of Blade Runner. There is a scene in that movie where you see water crashing up on this concrete shore. And granted, I don't know if it was in the movie or if maybe the, the theater itself made a mistake. But the perspective that you see, you are over the water staring at the waves hitting this concrete um, shore. So all of the, the action is happening in front of you. And all of a sudden, you hear those waves crash just out of the back left speaker. So you hear the sound coming from behind you, but you see it in front of you. And instantly, I couldn't enjoy the rest of the movie because of things like that. But then you have the flip side of that. The the second Maze Runner movie, 
there's a scene where the kids are they're trying to escape and they end up down in a sewer. And I forget the name of the surround sound artist who did the surround sound mix for Maze Runner. Uh, so if you're listening, thank you. Um, <laughs> the the surround sound was so well done that even my wife, who doesn't, I mean she she knows what audio is. But as far as like the understanding of it, like she, she's not that in depth with it. But so even for somebody like her, who as a general consumer looked at me and went, "Oh, that was good," because you hear like rats scurrying behind you, and you hear things that might be happening in a different tunnel of the sewer, and the surround sound mix in that scene was so phenomenally done that even as the general user, my wife was like, "Oh, wow." Um, so, I mean, technically, I guess it did kind of pull her out of that immersion, but there was a, the appreciation factor that then went in with that. So thanks for being on the show. Is there, how can people follow up with you if they have questions on something you had maybe said, or maybe just want to follow you and keep up with you and the work that you're working on? Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me. You're um, welcome. This was a lot of fun. Uh, you can find me, uh, primarily on Twitter at Carpenter Sound. Cool. And I will put all of the information and some of the stuff that Sean had mentioned in the show notes as well below. So you can check some of that stuff out, like Rick Veer's sample packs and maybe some of the movies that you had talked about and um, and your Twitter and stuff. So thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate all of the advice because I learned a couple things Absolutely. from you. So thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. And there you have it. Or should I say kaboom? There you have it. I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with the incredible Sean Carpenter, and I hope you learned a little bit about what sound design is, how to make an explosion, how he got his start, kind of what it was like working on a AAA video game. And as Sean and I had discussed, the sound design of a movie or video game can make or break that game. Because when you're in a horror movie and you have these very eerie sounds going or playing or sound effects going if those aren't there or they're not done properly you can be completely taken out of that so next time you watch a horror movie or an action movie or any kind of movie kind of pay attention to the sound design pay attention to the sound effects the walking the explosions um if possible listen to them in headphones if you're on a plane or if you're waiting for the bus or even just even at home put on a pair of headphones or earbuds and just kind of listen to how things are panned out and kind of in one ear and then in the other ear you have kind of traffic going on behind you pay attention to those little details as that's what makes a movie that's what makes it very immersive so i hope that you enjoyed the episode as mentioned um, i will put all of sean's links and everything and some of the th- things that we had talked about in the show notes below but please connect with sean if you have any questions about the show or anything that he had said within this episode and he would be more than happy to answer those and maybe go in a little bit more detail with you on something so i just want to remind you to sign up to my mailing list as it helps me notify you when new episodes like this are live There's also a link to Patreon, which has some perks for different tiers, and all of the money that I make through that will go directly back into the show so I can make it better for all of you. There's also a um, great appreciation for you listening, and I would appreciate a five-star rating and review as well within Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen to podcasts on, as it greatly helps boost the show within that platform so it can be discovered by other listeners, and so I can grow my audience and build a community around this, because that's really what I want to do with this show. And lastly, there is a guest request form in the show notes below. So if you or someone you know would be a good guest for the show, please fill it out and or send them that link and they can fill it out and I will reach out to them so we can become a guest and be connected so I can have them as a guest on the show. So thanks again for tuning in this week to listen to my conversation with the amazingly talented Sean Carpenter. And we will see you next week on When Life Hands You Lennons.